back, everyone. This is another episode of the Exodus Project. I'm your host, Steve Eisenhower. I am joined after quite a long time by my good friend, Davon Mays with Clouds of Torah. Davon, how you shalom, doing? Shalom, shalom. How you doing? I'm doing well. Doing well. It's always a good time when you and I can get together and put a put an episode out there. Definitely. Um, but before I get started, everyone, hit that subscribe button. Turn on the notifications, give Davon and myself a big thumbs up, and please check the description. Plenty of resources linked there. My book, his books, Hebrew Jumpstart, Learn Hebrew in an Hour. Lots of lots of cool things down there. Uh, so, Davon, there's a, there's a pretty common Christian apologetic, I guess you could say, to attempt to synchronize the genealogies in the new testament um there's the one in matthew and then there's the one in luke and they don't mesh as as you well know so what is said is that the one in luke is simply mary's genealogy um because of course according to the new testament jesus is born of a virgin right so ignoring all of the you know you need a human father all that Let's just hone in on the fact that Christianity has had a tradition. You know, just like all religions have tradition, Christianity equally has one, okay? Right. And they have a tradition of Mary's parents. And what's interesting is that tradition doesn't mesh with the genealogy either. So... Just at face value, I mean, what do you think about that? Off rip, before you even get there, a lot of people are not aware of Paul's letters who came before the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And Paul does say that Jesus was the son of David according to the flesh. But Paul also, and I believe it's in Titus and in like Timothy, I could be wrong about the book, but Paul says stay away from genealogies. Yep. So it's a little weird that Matthew starts off with a genealogy and Paul says avoid these things. Mm -hmm. Then Luke gives his genealogy, but again, Paul says avoid these things because <clears throat> we see from the gospel's perspective, there's problems with it. Now, Paul wasn't aware that these genealogies were going to be written, I would assume, because he wrote his letters first. Then the, the cleanup wasn't such a good cleanup. Right? Exactly. <laughs> like yeah. He said with this tradition and the genealogies don't match. They don't match the Tanakh. Well, there's a few names that match, but overall there's omitted names. There's added names. And in Luke's genealogy, he doesn't go from the line of Solomon. He actually doesn't even mention Solomon, right? Right. In the book of Luke, or in the in the gospel, Solomon is mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. But in Luke's genealogy of Jesus, how do you how do you omit Solomon? Right. <laughs> for that for that matter, real quick, Luke only has David as a king in the gen in his genealogy, whereas Matthew has fourteen, only fourteen because he omitted the rest. Right. The excuse is that he omitted only wicked kings, but he left in Manasseh, which was one of the most wicked kings. Right. So I'm not buying the excuses. Well, what's interesting is if if the descendants of Nathan are legitimate, right? If the author of Luke got the right names following Nathan, then that actually makes sense because they can't be kings because only Solomon's seed can be kings <laughs> because it doesn't, for example, David is king. The king that is anointed after him is Solomon. Therefore, Solomon's firstborn is then the successor, right? It would only be if Solomon were to die childless or something that then it would transfer to his brother. So it then goes to 
Solomon's son's firstborn, and then Solomon's son's son's firstborn, and so on and so forth, and it goes through that line. So, understandably, if you trace it through Nathan, they can't be kings. <laughs> they can't. Which is quite interesting uh, that, that that name even appears, and that that name and that bloodline is being given credence when... As we said, this is supposed to be Mary. So there are so many problems. It's coming from, yes, the house of David technically, but from the but from the kingly line of David? No, it's not. No. No. In fact, they only share really from what what, what would make the most sense is from Zerubbabel and Shealtiel. They have those names, but here's here's one of the biggest problems is um, Luke, when he begins his 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 gospel, or his his letter or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. he tells Theodos, who he's writing it to, right, <laughs> that this is for you one of the most accurate versions because everybody else has written their version, but here's my version. Yeah, and I've taken the time to, to get the best info, get it right, right. <laughs> Yep. But you completely drop the ball by skipping Solomon's bloodline and taking Nathan's. So who told you to use Nathan's bloodline? And Which completely tells you this ain't from the most high. Exactly. And furthermore, how could how could Nathan's patrilineal descent and Solomon's patrilineal descent converge onto the same person? How can how can Zerubbabel be how can Zerubbabel how can his father come from two guys? Does that make sense? It doesn't work. The, uh, because I just, what, what I just hope what I'm saying same. makes sense, right? Like, you have a father. Your father mm -hmm. had a father. His mm -hmm. father had a father. And so far, so far, going back all the way to... it, can't, <laughs> Your father's father can't be traced back in two directions. It can't go back to two guys. Right, it doesn't work. Like the Solomon and Nathan, <laughs> you know. Hmm. And I, I think, and and you, you can probably relate to this being former Christians. What's the famous line of when you have questions? You just gotta believe. It's the divine mystery. You gotta have faith. Yeah. Right. Oh, ye of little faith. Right. right? Well, that's not a, a really good excuse when I'm reading the problem. Right. And you spent a whole chapter dedicated to trying to tell me, because remember in John, it says all this was written so that you might believe. Mm -hmm. Well, if you wrote it, then it should make sense for me to believe, because if you just write a bunch of nonsense, am I supposed to believe that as well? Right. It's written, right? Am I supposed to believe that? And just that's because a very, it's written? And that's a very different, excuse me, that's a very different refrain compared to let's say say for your miyahu it's book of jeremiah that at every turn says and thus thus says the lord and the lord came to me saying right it doesn't say it doesn't say i wrote this so you would believe it says right that the word of hashem came to me and said say this to the people not that right. I just compiled some info and put it together so you'd believe in something I believe in. Right. That's a, I mean, that's a very stark contrast. Completely. Completely. And, and <clears throat> if you're going to use the genealogy, because a few times in the New Testament, it says son of David, right? Son of David, son of David. Was he really a son of David? And let's say he was. Well, David had many sons. Right. Mm -hmm. But sure. there's times where Jesus will say, well, someone greater than Solomon is here. Mm -hmm. Why would he mention Solomon? Because Solomon was a legitimate king. Right. So that would mean if you're really the son of David, you should be from the line of the kings. Because why would you use Solomon as an example if you're trying to follow in those footsteps? You're saying Solomon was great, but now I'm here. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? But you really not from Solomon if you didn't really have a dad. 
<laughs> right? If you're gonna go that route, right? Um, so it's just it's it just shows the 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 inconsistency of trying to establish Jesus as a son of David, established in the genealogy that even Paul says, don't bother with that. Like mm -hmm. The, so the, if, the, if, if the Holy Spirit was responsible for writing these gospels and these letters, these epistles of Paul, why would the genealogy be mentioned in one and shunned in another? Sure. And we did the all Torah has a huge genealogy, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the Chronicles, <laughs> a lot of Ezra, like there's multiple books of just genealogy in the Torah, right? Genesis chapter 10, the, the, the table of nations, like there's gen, the Torah is like a reading a will, the son of this, the son of him, the son of him, the son of him. Mm -hmm. So while all of a sudden will Paul be like, no, nah, I don't, don't mess with those genealogies. They just cause arguments. Well, why? Right. Probably for the exact reason of what we're sitting here and talking about right exactly. now. Exactly. And furthermore, we did a whole video called Emperor Jesus discussing the Roman adoption process and how you can really see that overlaid in the New Testament and this ad this adoption idea, Joseph adopting Jesus into the bloodline of the kings and so on. And really, it's in Paul's letters we see adoption as a forefront idea. So mm -hmm. if, if in one location, Paul is saying, don't worry about genealogies, and in other places, he's saying about adoption that we can all be adopted into the family of God and all these things. Um, it just goes to show where his mind's at, right? That God will mm -hmm. choose his successor as he will. He doesn't. It doesn't need to go by halakha. Right. Oh, yeah. If we if it's Paul and halakha, it's interesting that Paul briefly touches on his genealogy by just saying I'm a Pharisee son of a Pharisee tribe of Benjamin but doesn't mention his father or did I miss that maybe did I miss that Paul had a dad but no by name maybe I never you know it's yes. just interesting that of all the things you 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 hitting on the Pharisee of Pharisee tribe of Benjamin but I ain't gonna tell you who my dad was <laughs> hmm that's a little odd Okay. It's interesting. But I'm a especially, Roman citizen. Especially at a time when being a Roman citizen was quite prestigious. Uh, right. By the third, fourth century and so on, it wasn't so big of a deal. Um, but first century, <laughs> oh boy, that's that means something. And that actually comes through in the New Testament when and this is getting later on in Acts when Paul is approached by I would assume they're Roman soldiers if memory suits and he says he basically says what are you doing I'm a Roman citizen and they stand back they're like oh sorry didn't Not know bad. right <laughs> <laughs> right 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 because he's name drops Gamaliel right now technically Luke is the one who was I think it's in Acts that That's Luke says Acts, he yeah. studied under Gamaliel but again um, in, in is it Philippians this, he talks about I, I was a uh, studying under the strictness of the law, right? But he doesn't mention his dad. If you were such a tor raised such in the strict household as a Pharisee, why wouldn't you mention your dad? Because he's trying to get credibility, right? All the, I'm not lying. He's constantly trying to get these credibility stats, right? Of course. I just think mentioning your dad probably would have gave you a little, little bit more. That way, people can reference. Yeah, he he's from whatever he claimed to be. You know. And I mean? look, I mean, and look at all who he's writing to. He's writing to all a non-Jewish audience, with the exception of Romans. Um. And something most people don't know because they just think first century Israel was, you know, hunky dory. Uh. The majority of the Jews were living outside of the land of Israel for the entire Second Temple period. Most people don't know that. Right. Right. So, gold standard Judaism, of course, are the Purushim. So, of course, you do have Hellenistic Judaism in certain locations, Alexandria and so on. But just like today, this might be a bit anachronistic, but you ask just some passerby on the street, 
what do you first think of when you think of a Jew? They're going to say side curls or something to that effect. They're going to go right, right. to New York. <laughs> they're going to go right to the Orthodox or ultra Orthodox community. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, they don't think of reformed Jews because I don't want to knock anybody, but they just aren't noticeably Jewish. Right. Right. Just by looking at them, you don't see that they're Jews. Right. So the Purushim would have been. So I don't right. think it would really be much different even amongst the non-Jewish audience, then they know who the Jews are. They know the Orthodox community or the Purushim community, however you want to look at it, the Pharisaic community, because mm -hmm. as you'll hear all over YouTube all the time, that was gold standard Judaism. So right. Think, oh, the Jews, guess who you're going to think of? Right? You're right. not going to think of Essenes and caves in the middle of Sardinia, mm -hmm. you know? So when you're writing to a non-Jewish audience, you say, oh yeah, I'm an Orthodox Jew, and here's the message, because you don't know their theology, and you don't know their tradition, or this and that, so really you can say whatever you want, as long as you suggest that you are yourself part of the, you know, part of the community that the, that the mind you're speaking to is going to think of directly when they think of this group. Right. Does that, right. Does that make sense? Yeah, because even Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, the, mm -hmm. the gold standard, right? Mm -hmm. He tells you who the gold standard is, and that's why Paul is trying to always say he's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Like, I'm one of the top tier of that community, so I have this legitimacy, and it's like, uh, well, if you're talking to people who don't know anything about the Torah, what does Pharisee even mean? I don't know. They don't, they're not checking the Hebrew. They're not checking the oral traditions. Exactly. They just know exactly. by what you're telling them. <laughs> but they know that yeah. the Pharisees are these guys over there that get up early in the morning and wrap leather straps around their arms and pray. That's like, right, that's right. what they know. <laughs> right. Right. <clears throat> right. That's because that's all they couldn't know. They're not studying that because there's, you, you live, if you was to ask the, uh, the average Greek person walk around or the average Roman, Who's God? They're gonna say Zeus. Like yeah. When you read in the Book of Acts, mm -hmm. Zeus had a temple, right? And if you ask, well, who's the son of God? Well, Zeus had a whole bunch of sons: Hercules, yeah, which one? Poseidon, <laughs> and whoever, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, he had a whole bunch of. There's all so many a pantheon of gods. So your understanding of God was different from the Roman perspective. So a son of God to them is gonna be like, well, shoot, let's go through the list. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And even if you was to say Yeshua, you're gonna have to ask which one, because or Jesus, because we got Jesus uh Barabbas, you mm. got Jesus who surnamed Justice, yeah, you got Jesus the uh, uh you got Bar Jesus who was the false prophet. <laughs> so you're gonna have to go through a whole line of Jesuses, even in the New Testament, and people just don't know that because the, the church doesn't really tell you those things, right. Yep. Exactly. Um, and, and through the and through like the Greekified lens, you aren't really getting what the names would have been. Like Bar Jesus is one word, Barabbas is one word. Even though that's right. not how these words would have been. No, like it would have no. been Bar Yehoshua or Bar Yeshua, mm -hmm, Yeshua, mm -hmm. right? Or Bar Abbas. You know, not. Barabbas. <laughs> right. It sounds like one one word, right? It's literally son of, you know what I mean? So in Matthew 27, I believe, where it actually tells you there was two Jesuses in jail at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it says one was in jail with people who were part of a rebellion because they had killed somebody. Right. So if if you was to ask somebody, I'm with Jesus who's part of the revolution, which one? Again, which yeah, one? Exactly. You know what I mean? So these are just things because in most translations, the Jesus part is omitted. It just says Barabbas. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say Jesus Barabbas. So when y'all go and look that up, do your due diligence, it will tell you there were two Jesuses in jail that Pilate had to choose from. And one was a, I guess you would call a zealot, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you yep. ever looked into it and we can get into the presentation after this, but have you ever looked into like the Gnostic understanding of the two Jesuses, Barabbas and Jesus at the trial? Because there's a Just lot the of names. There's a lot of good scholarship that says that might actually be a Gnostic leftover that made it into the canon. That it is actually 
a Gnostic representation of Yom Kippur and the scapegoat versus the goat that is taken into the temple. The Bar Abbas, the son of the father, gets released, but the son of God, the other Jesus, gets sacrificed as the atonement. Now that you say that, I wonder, and I'm not saying that this is a connection, but I wonder if there's a connection to where why Muslims say Jesus was not crucified, but there was somebody in his place. Yeah, right. They say it was Judas that was on the cross, I think. Or it's somebody else, basically, right? So like a look alike. If there was yeah. two Jesuses, is it that people confuse them because they say, okay, which Jesus is that? I just heard Pilate say Jesus twice, but I didn't know about the, the son of the father. Well, Jesus is also called the son of the father in the gospels. Mm -hmm. And then he's also called the Christ. So, you know, it seems like there was a lot of confusion going on there. And if you read the original text that actually says Jesus Barabbas and Jesus the Christ in Matthew 27, exactly. you don't have to decipher exactly. what's going on. So you have the right? divine Christ, which is what is sacrificed for the sins of mankind, which in Gnostic thought would be the, the, the divine son's job, the Christ, is mm -hmm. to undo the works of the demiurge, right? Um, versus Jesus, son of the father. And that's why they're really saying this is a, it doesn't come through in the canon, in the canonical gospels, but in Gnostic literature, it's all over the place, that this is really the New Testament's version of the Yom Kippur ritual of the two goats. Mm. That one is released, mm. one is offered, right? Right, right. And goats, though, not lambs. <laughs> yeah. Side note. Interesting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting stuff, but it's it's cool when you read Gnostic literature because it's it's old. I mean, it's very old. It's old, right? <laughs> and just the very esoteric nature makes you wonder if they even actually believed any of this stuff was literal. You know, because it's right. it's meant to be very mysterious, and I think what hurt Christianity and the fact that. YouTubers like you and myself are even gaining traction is because they sided with a literalistic reading rather than the Gnostic understanding that a lot of these things are metaphors and allegories of divine esoteric like secrets, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the literalistic choice that the church adapted actually hurt it in the long run. Well, it's, it's out of it, they. They pick it. I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you, but they basically, when it's convenient, it's literal. Sure. But when it's not convenient, fulfilling the prophecies, oh, he spiritually did right. That's it's not literal. He didn't really do it, but spiritually he did it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's they they pick and choose when they want to actually be real literal, and then as everything else is spiritualized to give excuses of why he didn't fulfill any prophecies. Of course. That's how the whole, that's how revelation made it in the canon to begin with. Because right. <laughs> Augustine said, no, this isn't anti-Rome propaganda. This is allegory. <laughs> and they said, okay. Right. It's not real. <laughs> right. <No. laughs> but all right, let me share my screen. We can get into this. This is some good stuff. Okay. So this article I have, I, took from Britannica. So if you have a problem with it, comment, send a hate mail to them, not to me. Um, so we're going to go over the church tradition. According to Britannica, they have no dog in this fight. Okay. Um, what they say of Mary's parentage. Okay. So information concerning their lives and names is found in the second century proto gospel of James. And the third century, Evangelium de Nativity Mariae, probably butchered that Latin, which is the gospel of the nativity of Mary. So according to these non-canonical sources, Anne, or in Hebrew, Hannah, was born in Bethlehem in Judea. She married Joachim, and although they shared a wealthy and devout life in Nazareth, they eventually lamented their childlessness. Joachim, reproached at the temple for his sterility, retreated into the countryside to pray, while Anne, or Hannah, 
grieved by his disappearance and by her barrenness, solemnly promised God that if given a child, she would dedicate it to the Lord's service. Both received the vision of an angel who announced that Anne would conceive and bear a most wondrous child, the Virgin Mary. The couple rejoiced at the birth of their daughter, who Anne named Mary. And when the child was three years old, Joachim and Anne, in fulfillment of her divine promise, brought Mary to the temple of Jerusalem, where they left her to be brought up. The account of their lives startlingly parallels the Old Testament story of the barren Hannah, same name, and her conception of Samuel. She also dedicated her child to the service of God. That's directly from Britannica. Okay? So what's interesting is that Christian apologetic of Luke's genealogy says it's being traced to Mary's father. Right? That's always what you're going to hear, is that the final name in that genealogy is that of Mary's father. So according to church tradition... This is second century, so it's it's pretty early, especially since we have a lot of scholarship saying Luke is second century now. Um, these things could be contemporaneous. Uh, so Luke says that – are they saying Joseph is Mary's father? I think that's how they normally um yeah that's how they normally present it. Right. Right. Well not according to church tradition. I and mean, we just read what is clearly a just rip off from 1 Samuel. <laughs> right? I mean as, <laughs> right. as I was reading that I mean it's 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 the exact same story. The names are the exact same. same story literally. <laughs> Even the same name. Um, so what's interesting here is they're, they're making this, almost this false dichotomy. And I find it so interesting when you would ask a Christian who does side with that idea that, oh, this is Mary's genealogy, and you present Christian tradition to them, a tradition that's actually pretty well known. I mean, you can... You can like visit Mary's birthplace in Sepphoris and all sorts of different places. And there's, I think there's um, tradition that they lived near Mount Tabor and all sorts, or Mount Tabor and all these different things. Uh, the New Testament even says in Thessalonians that the teachings by word are what you need to keep. And the Catholics are the ones who say that they have maintained the oral teachings of the apostles. Um, so when you have these newfound people siding with things that don't, that really go against church tradition, Davon, in your opinion, like, how are we sp supposed to approach that? You know, because you'll even see Protestant versus Catholic debates and Catholics will bring up Thessalonians and say, look, we maintain the oral traditions that Paul and the apostles told us to maintain, you know? Well... Sola Scriptura is out the window when it comes to something like this, right? Because this is clearly, you know, um, a church tradition, which most of the things that people do, not not the not the the reading of them, but the things that people do. For instance, Lent, you mm -hmm. won't find Lent in the New Testament. You won't find Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, like all these things are. <clears throat> Put putting the word Easter instead of Passover in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. This is this is not in the text. This is these are traditions that have been added. So the the whole sola scriptura approach, um, making uh, people bishops and deacons and priests, <clears throat> the way that that's done today, telling people that they can't get married, those are all traditions that have been established by the church, like. You know, be fruitful and multiply is what the Torah says. Um, even Jesus says, for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and stick to his wife. Now, all of a sudden, the priest cannot be married. And, and one of the reasons is because it says that if the deacons or the bishops want to move up rank, they have to be married. So that's what the New Testament says. But when it comes to the priest, it doesn't say if you want to be a priest, 
you're not to be married. So again, that's another church tradition. So I think this is another uh, picking and choosing of when to apply church tradition and when to ignore it, depending on which denomination you are. Of course. And you can rightly see that the Protestants had a, they had a beef, but it, it's a half beef because on one hand, they'll stick to the text, but on the other hand, they will follow the church doctrine, even concerning the names of the gospels. Oh, sure. They keep the things that work for them. Exactly. So, it, you know, it's like, okay, you're not really all in on one, one side of the fight because over here you accept it, but over here you don't. So, right. you know, they hold, um, they hold to the dating of Easter, which is a Catholic mm -hmm. tradition. They utilize the Gregorian calendar just like every other, just like the Catholics do. Well, that's a Catholic yeah. invention. We got, we got lessons on all this, y'all. Like everything we're talking about between the Exodus Project and Clouds of Tour, we cover the calendars and the, the traditions and the letters written from Rome and all these different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Hannah or St. Anne and Joachim are never mentioned, I don't believe, in the New Testament. Um, so I think that's why you will see these New Age apologists who say, oh, well, this is Mary's genealogy. There are even relatively... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Scholars that I like, for example, like Dr. Tabor, who says that same thing, that this is Mary's genealogy, but it doesn't say that, you know? And let me say this, just for the record. Even if it is, church tradition is totally wrong, it's all made up. Even if it is, it's not doing any favors. Because look at the look at some of the names here. Uh, Matat. Matatias, <laughs> or Matis, Mata, <laughs> Matatias, which I'm sure in... Aramaic or Hebrew would be more like Matis Yahu, right? There's mm -hmm. two of those. Ma'at, right? A lot of those words, I mean, I might not have to say it, but you have Matat, son of Levi, right? Yanai. Eliezer. Uh-huh. We got a lot of Levite names in there. <laughs> yeah, and and what we do see that Mary has a cousin, Elizabeth, of the house of Aaron, right? Right. That's explicit in Luke that she had a that she had a, a kinswoman named Elizabeth who was of the stock of Aaron. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing in her own. If this is, if this is legitimately Mary's genealogy, we're seeing Levite names. So was it her mother or her father that linked her to the tribe of Levi? From what I'm seeing if, here, if, everything... If the dads were brothers, and Joseph's, I mean, in, in, in uh, um, her dad was from the tribe of Judah, but let me before I even go there. <clears throat> if Joseph and Mary were from Judah, why would God have to intervene and and have Mary pregnant with the Holy Spirit if they were legitimately from Judah anyway? Exactly. Exactly. But if they weren't, and Mary's dad was from the tribe of Judah, he he would and he had a brother. That would make her 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 uncle married to uh, Elizabeth, two brothers from two different tribes. That's a little weird. Um, and if their mom, if the if the mom was from, if her mother was from Judah, which this is kind of this is what I'm getting from this, right? Like Anna and Jehoiakim, is that is that his name in this? Um, mm -hmm. Yep, they're from Judah then unless the sister married outside of the tribe and married a Levite, but that will mar her inheritance because you're supposed to stick to your tribe so you can get your inheritance mm -hmm. according to the Torah, right? So it's just weird how they try to 
make that in in, in the new in the New Testament. There's actually a prophetess named Anna, but she's not Mary's mother. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if they just picked the name Hannah because they could borrow the story from the book of Samuel, but <clears throat> you, you'd have to pick and choose. Because if you, if let's say you accept this, right? Let's say you don't even question it. You just accept this. If you accept this oral tradition and you reject the Tanakh's oral tradition, then you're not using just weights and measures. Mm -hmm. So let's let me just let's just ex examine some of these names. So the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans, right? They were the kings, the Levite priestly kings that kind of usurped the throne after Hanukkah, right? Right. Um. I don't know how familiar you are with 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 like that era but this name sticks out at me very much Yanai and that is, is he... go ahead well, so I'm just wanting, wanting to see how many generations back this is so you have Joseph so one Two, three, four, five. Five generations, roughly a hundred years, right? That sounds about right. A hundred years back for five generations. If you think about Give 20, you're basically mm -hmm. you know, reproducing roughly. at the age of 20, right? Right. When was Jesus born, give or take? 2000, well, 20, some, 2000 some years ago, depending on who you ask. Would have been like four to zero, like four to one BCE, right? Oh, you talking about oh, in in that, yeah, between between zero and six is what okay. I've seen. So let's look zero to six, a hundred years before that. Do you know who the Hasmonean king was a hundred years before that? Hasmonean king, no. Alexander Yanaeus, also known as Alexander Yanai. Yanai. Who ruled as king and high priest from 103 to 76. And mm. look years. at there. The son of Levi is right above that. Yanai. Mm. Mm -hmm. What does Melchi mean? King. My king. Yeah. My king, the son of Yanai, who was high priest and king. The son of Matatias sounds a lot like Matas Yahoo to me. Right, right. Um, so, you are, like, is it starting to make sense, people? That maybe this isn't so accurate? And if it is accurate, it might be tracing through the wrong line of kings? <laughs> now I'm going to have to go back and read Maccabees to get the genealogy. Mm -hmm. And Josephus. Read Josephus because he has the... He has the uh, bad part of the Hasmoneans too. Um, and was it Herod that killed all the Hasmoneans? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. But what's funny is Luke says he got all the best info. Right. He but, does. He's saying, he says but, but he's saying that Hasmoneans are coming from Zerubbabel. And or he's telling Thuidus, who's probably a Roman official, he's got the best information. Exactly. So does What's he have the, the best information, or is he kind of just looking at maybe a history sheet, seeing all the names of the kings, whether they're actually from Judah or not, and writing it down? Right. And if you skip down to where it says the sons of Zerubbabel, the, the, the Zerubbabel, <clears throat> uh, the son of Shealtiel, there's another Melchi. Mm -hmm. Right, son of Neri, son of Melchi, son of Adai. So, so again, what's the chances of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, that Mary has the exact same names in her genealogy as Joseph? Mm -hmm. But they both come from one comes from Solomon, one comes from Nathan. What's the chances of that? The exact same people. I mean, it just. <clears throat> really doesn't work mm -hmm. 
Right. Like it, it just doesn't work. Can you scroll down just a little bit or scroll sure. up so I can see the bottom of this? Mm -hmm. So we see again, we see another Levi. We see Simeon. We do see a Judah, son of Joseph, right? Mm -hmm. Son of Nathan, son of David. So what's the chances that David, Jesse, Obed, Boaz also are in uh, Mary's genealogy and in Joseph's genealogy? Mm -hmm. The exact same order of names? David, Jesse, Obed, Boaz? <laughs> really? In the exact same order? Then when you get to Zero Booboo and uh, Shealtil, the exact same order? Like, <clears throat> it's very... The reach is crazy. Yeah. And, yep. you know, and like we said, that um, Luke doesn't have any kings of Judah in his bloodline except for David. He's got other sons of David. Nathan right. is a son of David, but Nathan is not from the kings. So I want and see, I've heard this argument. I'm not saying it's true, but I heard the argument that Luke got his information from Josephus. So when you say Josephus has the, the genealogy of the Hasmonean kings, did Luke read that thinking it was the bloodline of Judah? It's possible. Because look, king. look where he has here. He has... Zerubbabel. Okay, now you have. Mm -hmm. So this is still first exile. Yoda, Yosef. Let's start at the first Matatias. Okay, Matasyahu. So 166 BCE, the first Hasmonean. Guess what his name is? Matasyahu. Succeeded by his sons, Yohanan, Shimon, Judas, Eliezer, Yehonatan. So what do you, what do we have here? We have Maat. Okay, there's another Matatias on the next uh, generation, and then you have Judah, John Hyrcanus. The generation after that is Aristobulus, and then Alexander Yanai, like we mentioned, Antigonus of Shalom. Okay. So we're up here. You have another Hyrcanus, Aristobulus, Alexander, Antigonus Matisyahu, Mariamne. Oh, Mary, Miriam, Mariamne. I'm not trying to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but a lot of these names are very similar. Eli? I mean, Yanai is a Greek word. <laughs> like <laughs> Eli. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, since we're not reading this in the Greek, I'm sure that that will bring some light to the table as well. Sure. But just the amount of Matis Yahoos, when you look at. There's a, there's a lot. And the Levi's, there's more than one. There's more than one Levi. Yeah. Yep. And the. And the, the term Melki is in there twice. Mm -hmm. My king, yeah, and we know that the priests used the term king. They were they were kings in their view. It wasn't kosher, but that's how they were looked upon. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so it's 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 very interesting, and the image the image I'm looking at of the Hasmonean dynasty has everything in Greek. It doesn't have their Hebrew names. So, but <laughs> what's what's interesting is even if Luke played with some stuff and didn't necessarily get all the names right, what is very hard to discount is that after Zerubbabel, starting like right here, a lot of these names are very Hasmonean. Right. I don't think that can be a I don't think that can be a coincidence, especially when you have Melchi in there. I mean, my king, thats that has to be what that means, right? I, I have a lot of Jewish friends. I don't know any of them. I don't know any of them I'll named Melech. My king, just like rabbi is my rabbi. So. Exactly. And like I said, I have a lot of Jewish friends. I don't know any of them named Melech. 
<laughs> you know? So was that more of a honorary term rather than a name? I don't know. This is all, this is all speculation. We can't know this stuff for sure, but I think what Davon and I have demonstrated thus far is one, it variegates from the church tradition Two, it has really no resemblance to the genealogy in Matthew. And it doesn't mention any of the Davidic Kings correctly, but what it does do, is, but what it does do is name some of the Hasmonean Kings roughly around the same time when they would have been ruling. So, Take that as you will. Mind Side you, note. Mind sorry, you, it's, sorry, not, go ahead. it's not 100% the same. I'd be the it's first, not, I'd be not the first one to say that. But there are, there are striking similarities to the Hasmonean dynasty here. So Judas Maccabees, right? Since if we're going to deal with that situation, um, if you look up his... Matt, Mattathias was his father. His yep. four brothers were John, Simon, Eliezer, and Jonathan. Mm -hmm. We see Eliezer, we see um, Matt, a couple of Mattathiases in here. Um, they're not in the order. And these are, of course, these are his brothers. So that's not, these are not his sons. But this is some things to look into. If you was to go through their bloodlines and their genealogies, if you could find those things, and I don't know if there will be in the apocryphal writings or anything of that nature, but um, it just it seems like there was so much trying to prove things in the New Testament. They made a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. trying to, to offer proofs and convince you. Because I asked somebody this, I said, if you compare David to Jesus. Did David have any campaigns that people had to be convinced that he was the king Messiah? And they said, no. I said, why? Because he was actually sitting on the throne ruling and doing his job. To where Jesus didn't do any of that. He didn't sit on the throne. He did not rule. And he did not do what a Messiah was supposed to do. He did not fight the battle. Because why did they want a king? It says so he can go in and out of before us and fight our battles, like the nations. Mm -hmm. David did that. Jesus came and said, turn the other cheek. Right. Well, you don't win wars like that. The Romans are not going to leave if you turn the other cheek. They're going to cut off the other. They're going to cut it off. And probably with your head. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that 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 approach doesn't work. And the very the New Testament is very nice to the romans mm -hmm. not not much negativity it even says um I, I, even out of all israel i haven't found somebody with so much faith right it, it like gives so much credit it makes Pilate out to be a nice guy right uh, uh paul tells agrippa or agrippa tells paul oh you almost made me be a christian like it is so pro roman right. romans 13 obey the superior authorities which were the romans at that time so when you just read the, the book itself and, and for, forget what you believe, if you just read the book as is, it's very pro-Roman. Yep. And the Romans have their own book in the New Testament. That's a little odd. Mm -hmm. That the fourth beast in Daniel <laughs> gets their <laughs> own <laughs> right. dedication, and it tells you to obey them. Not, not only that, the, that they have their book, it says obey that superior authority. Mm -hmm. Right? It's, it's just really weird to where it's almost like, I don't want to say that it's directly propaganda, but it smells of it. Right. Especially when we've demonstrated Paul's relation to the Herods. I've done a whole Christian origins video linking the Herods, the Essenes, John the Baptist, all these different things. Um, On top of Josephus's perspective of that whole situation. Exactly, exactly. And what's interesting is you see what is seeming to be um, what is seeming to be the gospel's way of showing Jesus's genealogical uh, resume, right? What makes him legitimate. In the back of Herod's mind, what made him feel legitimate? 
because he was an Edomite, son of a convert, right? Mm -hmm. What made him feel legitimate was marrying into the Hasmonean family, marrying Mariamne. Um, so he didn't even come from Judah. He married into the Levi family, is what you're saying. Of course, no. He was he's an I Idumean, an Edomite. And his right, right. his father Mary, right. His father converted. It was actually under the Hasmoneans. I want to say it was John Hyrcanus. Don't quote me, but I want to say that's who it was. One of the one of the Hasmoneans prior to this time um conquered Idumea and forced forcibly converted them all. And I read I read about that. That, and that was one that, of the only times the Jews forcibly converted people. And from that, well, mind you, this is already quite a bit into the this is already quite a bit into the Hasmonean dynasty. They're already being very heavily influenced by Greek thought at this time. Right. They're taking Greek names, right? Uh, right. So I think it may have been more of a way of showing their domination, right? Uniting on trying to unite the their vassals under one one religion, perhaps. Right. And I and I wasn't saying that that was kosher that he forcibly converted. Of course. Of course. That's just and being being if if, if you're going from that perspective of it's almost like when the Levites try to overthrow Moses and Aaron and Moses told them you're overstepping your boundaries. Mm-hmm. You're doing too much, basically. Right. But, <laughs> but that's the point where Herod became Jewish. Mm -hmm. so we know, according to Halacha and so on, that forced conversions aren't kosher. Exactly. So, um, but that's neither here nor there. Right. But he never felt legitimate. He, he wasn't Hasmonean. He's Idumean, so any learned Jew would say, "Listen, dude, you're really not, <laughs> not a, you know, a kosher king, much less, you know, the the true king of Judah." You know, so I think he had, I think he had probably a complex, a legitimacy complex, and he, you know, tried to make up for it by building all these beautiful buildings, um, and ultimately marrying Mariamne which I think made him feel a bit more legitimate because now he's married into the Royal family of the time, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So we we've seen these connections between the new Testament, its characters and the Herods. And now we're seeing a very strong, very possible connection to the Hasmonean house as well, which I'm not necessarily saying that Jesus was a Hasmonean, but what I'm saying is, Whoever authored Luke may have just written down names to make it sound legitimate. And he didn't anticipate people were going to fact check. And um, side note, um, if Herod married into the Hasmonean dynasty, which were Levitical in background, right? Right. Do you think that's where the corruption of the priesthood began, or was it already corrupted? before that i think it was already corrupted before that um because they were serving as high priest and king right so one of the reasons i brought that up because we well, i shouldn't have said that i shouldn't have put it in that way i should have said it was already corrupted before that but it continued because really now that i just think about it in maccabees we see the corruption with uh, uh, some of the priests as well. And I, I just, I'm wondering if when Herod took over, he just basically continued that. Oh, of course. Corruption and, it, of course. and it transferred over to the Sadducees. Because so I guess I didn't ask the question, right? I, well, yeah, yeah, I, just, yeah. I had another thought. So, yeah. so they went from had Hasmoneans to the Sadducees, right? Is that, right. is that what you see happening? Of course, because what is the, I mean, let's tease this out. Let's tease this out in a conversation. What are the Sadducees notorious for? 
not believing in stuff and what's breaking the rules. What's the main thing they didn't believe in? Resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. Um, or the or oral, something else. Oral tradition, right? Right. And it's this is in the New Testament, y'all. This is not our opinions. It tells you what they didn't believe in. Now, if you're of a family who believes that you can be high priest and king at the same time. Mm, the book of what are, Hebrews. What are you? Hebrews. What are you? <laughs> what, are you what, what, what are you going to reject? Right, you're going to reject the oral tradition that says there's no kosher way that's possible. Mm -hmm. Because in the Torah itself, you might not find a very explicit statement saying you can't be a Levite and be a ruler or something to that effect. So what you do is you take away the oral traditions, you take away all the oral Torah, say it doesn't exist because it goes against it goes against what I want to do, <laughs> right? Because you do see in uh, kings that there was a succession and you see another kingdom arise under a tribe that isn't Judah. Which goes to show that there could be there could be Jewish rulers that aren't from the tribe of Judah. So what you do is you negate the oral tradition. Say no, we reject that. And now your your dual status of high priest and pseudo king might seem to have a bit more legitimacy. And from what I understand, the Essenes actually seceded from the Sadducees for that very reason, because as you know, the Essenes were very esoteric. They clearly held mm -hmm. on to mm -hmm. Kabbalistic ideas, very oral tradition-based ideas. Um, so they were a priestly family, also influenced by Hellenistic thought, but extremely esoteric and kind of went a bit off the deep end in the other direction. So as the Sadducees kind of negated anything that might hurt their wallet and their and their power play, the Essenes kind of went the opposite direction. Hmm. And it's interesting that the Essenes were the people who also were a people, not the, but a people who also had a little bit of touch of celibacy going on in there, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is also what Paul and Jesus kind of touched on a little bit too. Of course, yep. So it's interesting that the Essenes have this type of priestly persona, and the Sadducees have that persona, but they're really not a lock, a legitimate priests. Right. And the Essenes had their own quarters in Israel, mm -hmm. and the Sadducees were the the priest in charge. Mm -hmm. So it just seems like there was a lot of corruption with the priesthood itself. And then you get the book of Hebrews, which co-signs the priest king idea. Exactly. Exactly. Um, which doesn't have a writer either. It doesn't have an yeah. author. Yeah. It's but just does, called the book of Hebrews. But does, does what I teased out there make sense as to why they would want to reject the oral traditions? Completely, because the, the, you, if you if you reject the tradition, then you, you don't have nobody to challenge your ideas. Right, and you can really tease out of the text anything you want. Right, and on top of that, this is why Paul said in Galatians 1.12, I didn't learn this from anybody, meaning this didn't come from what I learned from Gamaliel. I got this from the revelation of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You can't challenge that because who are you going to challenge it with? Like, that's, that's sure. a one man's testimony sure i mean you can we can say you know you don't have two witnesses but you know who was there that saw you get this revelation and that's what he told you to where you're claiming this is from jesus so he only comes to you and not the other disciples mm -hmm. yeah and then once the herods take over i mean that the hasmoneans are gone but you still have that sadducee that sadducee vein of the priesthood that came out of that and they simply just start becoming chosen really bought by you know buying their position via right. the roman vassals whether it be the herods or the praetor or so on and now it's it's basically you're selling off 
because let's be real, religion and government were much more entwined than they are in our present day. Completely. So if you were if you were the head of the temple, I mean you were a you were a honcho. You know? Yeah. So you got in tight with the government and consider this, if you are Herod or the the um the praetor at the time, the Roman praetor, are are you going to install someone as high priest who's going to do it correctly according to Jewish law, or someone who's going to listen to you, be willing to up the taxes, um, and basically be in your pocket, <laughs> right? Or are you going to do? Are you going to go with the route that is going to uphold? Jewish law over your law. Probably You're going to go with the one who's not going to mess up the money. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I think that kind of shed some light on where the Sadducees, you know, fell into that hierarchy of, mm -hmm. of you know, sex of the first century. And if you don't believe yeah. the resurrection of the dead or Anything like that? No afterlife? I mean, what's stopping you from just getting in the pocket of the Romans? Make money while I'm here, <laughs> right? Right. Get all the which power and money I weirder. can while I'm here. You right, know? which is even weirder that if the Sadducees held these beliefs and Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, why would he go to them to get permission to kill Jews? Right. They wasn't even on the same page. And Gamaliel said, leave the Jews or leave the Christians alone. Right. So does that mean he's so, he's outright disobeying his teacher, which I can only compare it to fr Jewish friends I have, but the Jewish friends I have have the utmost respect for their teachers. Like won't even won't even give you an answer to a question without saying, I learned this directly from my teacher and I have to give him the credit. So right, That's usually how they you right, right. So That's, he didn't learn that from Gamaliel. Where did he get this idea that I need to start persecuting these these Christians when he, he if, if anybody was the problem was the Romans, but people would the other Jews believed, you know what I mean? He wasn't going after the Sadducees for their, you know, her, heretical beliefs. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden other Christians is a big threat, right? Right. Why? They, you know what I mean? They didn't have no power. They just had this belief that this other guy was a was a prophet or whatever, or the son of right. God, whatever. But yep. they had no power. But the Sadducees actually held power. So why would mm -hmm. you go to them to conspire against the actual, you know, your own people? Then you lie about it in Acts twenty eight when he goes to Romans and say, "I haven't done nothing against my people or the law." Right. And in, in the Acts same vein. 17. In the same vein of rejecting oral tradition and monetizing religion, Paul did the exact same thing. We have him talk about where it talks about don't muzzle an ox while it's threshing, right? We understand from Jewish teachings, traditions, so on, that's explicitly meant to be because the animal is suffering if it's surrounded by grass that it wants to eat, but it can't, right? right. That's hard. It's stressful. It's stressful on the animal. And the Torah is telling you, like, you need to be humane to your animals, right? So don't muzzle it while it's working. Paul says, do you really think that has to do with animals? Of course not. God doesn't care about oxen. What that means is you need to you need to pay me. You need to give me money. Give money to the minister. So he already, said he was robbing other churches. Exactly. Exactly. So we already see a clear rejection of standardized mainstream Jewish tradition and teaching for monetized uh, prosperity doctrine <laughs> is really the easiest way to put it. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because I have a lecture called I Never Met a Christian, and I show that the early church, the early Christians, and if you start from from like the, the Gospels and into the book of Acts. 
Christians don't practice what the first ones did because they were really about socialism. Like the church owned everything. People were selling all their property and giving it to the church, which according to the Torah is not allowed. You're not allowed to sell your property because it don't belong to you. Exactly. So most high, this is my land. said, this is my land. Because mm -hmm. if you give it to the church, you think they're going to give it back during the Jubilee? Mm -hmm. They're not under the law anymore, right? So you ain't getting that back. <laughs> So nobody, nobody today is selling other property and giving it to the church. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said, I, that's just one reason. If you go through the lecture, I've never met a Christian. It just shows you over and over. People don't practice what the first Christians practice or what Jesus practiced. People are not homeless going around doing miracles. That's what classify as a true follower of Jesus. You have to be homeless and you've got to be able to do miracles. <laughs> Even though I don't know any Christians. Even though in Matthew 24, Jesus says that false Christs and false prophets will do miracles too. Right. So even if you are doing that, you're probably a false prophet. But you're probably not homeless though either. <laughs> it's funny. I was I was engaging in a conversation with a Christian recently. You know, said he wanted to have civil, non-argumentative conversation. I said, sure, shoot me a text, shoot me an email, we can talk. Br Teased out some explicit verses, points. It was always changed to ambiguous, obscure passages. As you know, that's always the mm -hmm. that's always the go-to. Right. But it finally got to the point I said, listen, why wasn't why wasn't Bar Kokhba the Messiah? Why wasn't any number of people the Messiah? And the response was, did he do miracles? And I said, it's interesting you ask me that, because Deuteronomy 13, and even Jesus in Matthew 24, say miracles kind of don't matter. They don't. That even false prophets can do miracles. Why wasn't Simon a, a, a Messiah then? He could do miracles. Mm -hmm. And they thought he had the power of God, which slaps John 3, 2 in the face. It says, how can he do these things unless he has the power of God? Exactly. And it slaps Hebrews in the face too, because the book of Hebrews says, you know, how could we reject the salvation when we saw the signs and the wonders that he that he did? <laughs> you know. You see what happens when you actually study, you know how to answer people. And it's not that you gotta be a scholar, you just gotta read the book. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so it's it's very interesting. But it, I just find it funny that that is always like a go-to counter argument, mm -hmm. right? The signs and wonders idea when you even have from the mouth of Jesus, like I don't even need to go to Deuteronomy 13. I can go to the mouth of Jesus and show that even he said that miracles really don't prove anything because even false Christs and false prophets will do signs and wonders. Well, see, even with that said, what does Matthew or Mark say? This is the sign of the believers that you can do miracles. So what believer do you know that can do miracles? <laughs> I've never seen nobody do miracles at church. And even if you can, you might be a false prophet. Because right? it's probably going to go to your head. And you're going to think you're somebody, right? Like it just, it doesn't, it just doesn't work. And who's going to be like drinking poison and messing with snakes? And plus, right. Jesus said, you're going to raise the dead and heal the sick. Like every Christian church, should go to all the hospitals. All the hospitals should be empty. Yep. And why does that encompass, happen? Encompass this all into the false prophet idea. If you can do these things, it's guaranteed. Not a believer. It's guaranteed you are a false <laughs> prophet. Why? Because if you're doing it through the power of Jesus Christ, that means one, you believe a man is God, and two, you are worshiping a God that. The Jews that stood at Sinai, their fathers didn't believe in. Right. So three strikes, you're out every time. Right? It just doesn't work. Yeah, right. It doesn't work. You know what I mean? It, it just really doesn't work. And Jesus says you will be able to do things greater than these things. Well, what when that, what have they done that's greater than that? Yeah. I mean, I you have, have, seen nobody you have the stories. Nobody. You have the stories of Acts where. Peter is healing paralytics with just his shadow, but <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? Like, okay, 
Well, it's it's the deflection from the actual prophecies or like, you know, things that everybody can see, rebuilding the temple, bringing peace to the world, you know, putting the end to wars. Like everybody can witness that. Everything else is if you're not there, you're not going to see this miracle that I did in the some obscure village. You know what I mean? But everybody going to, it says in Ezekiel, all the nations will know that I'm God in your midst when this temple is built. Exactly. You can't fake that. You know what I mean? Especially today with social media, you can see what's going on in China real time. Yeah. So people can see the actual temple. They can see the Shekinah at the temple. Like everything that the Torah tells you, you can see it. It's not going to be a belief who the Messiah is. Like today, whether you agree or not, there's a president in the White House. Mm -hmm. That's not a belief. That's just what it is. When there's an actual Messiah on the throne, it's not going to be a belief. He's going to be there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, belief versus facts is is a, is a clear distinction between Tanakh and Tanakh's version of a Messiah in a, in, a, in a new covenant opposed to believing that you're under a new covenant that doesn't have any rules based around it. Yep. So exactly right. But yeah, we took a we took a bunch of different angles tonight, Davon. Um, but as far as genealogies, you and I had a, and we can kind of wrap it up at this point. But you and I had a conversation before um, that you mentioned that via genealogy, Jesus, Jesus is proven according to the flesh, right? Uh, I think we talked about this a few days ago. We shared, we had like a little text conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, what's, but what's very interesting talking about being proven via the flesh, we already, you know, really delved into the genealogy thing, showed all the problems, but doesn't Paul kind of say the flesh doesn't matter? In, in no, you can be in adopted. Fact, in fact, when he says that he has all the right to boast in the flesh, he says, but I count it all as excrement, right? It's all refuse to me. My my resume according to the flesh it's all through christ and in christ right so why should i and that might even be another contributing factor as to why he says don't even worry about genealogies because this guy's some divine mystery religion you know christ christological gnostic figure like <laughs> what does the flesh matter you know i think that's really what paul was getting to is like what's the what's the core of mystery mystery religion belief it's you know that divine gnosis right the the spirit and the the second atom idea all these different things that none mm -hmm. of it can be verified you know right. it's all spiritual it's all within you well i think people when you start talking about the divinity of the Messiah, of course, they're going to go to Philippians 2 and 6, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with that thinking that Jesus is God as well as a Messiah is Jesus claims to have a God. Even yeah. in Revelation, when he's already in heaven, it says this is the revelation God gave Jesus to give to John, right? So mm -hmm. he gave himself a revelation to give to somebody else. Right. In Revelation, it says that he was the beginning of the creation of God, right? Um, it's in Colossians, too. In Colossians, too, right? So if Jesus is a creation, in the book of Romans, it says people are worshiping the creature instead of the creator. Mm -hmm. So you can understand that even though there's many excuses made by the writers of the New Testament to say, well, you just don't understand Paul. Paul contradicts himself so much. You can't give him any excuses. Like how many times do you have to contradict yourself on your complete, your core doctrines? Right. You know what I mean? And then they, they're adding in text. When first John five and seven, the scholars are tell you that even the New Testament text will have a footnote you know, say that this is not in the original text. They're adding text to try to prove this divinity. And even when you go there, depending on the translation, it's worded completely different. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's completely different. So over and over again, you see Paul is not, and Paul's not writing you the word of God 
he's writing letters to people criticizing his doctrine. Right. You don't see thus said the Lord in Paul's letters. He'll say, I forbid women to teach. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? I. You forbid women to have authority over men. Well, what about Deborah in the book of Judges? She was a prophet and a judge. Yep. Exactly. You right. forbid women to speak. Well, how can she be a prophet and can't speak to nobody? <laughs> What's the point? You know what I'm saying? Hannah in the New Testament, if Hannah was a prophetess, when exactly was she able to give her prophetic insight on anything? Right. So it's, it's, it's clear that these books are not divine in the New Testament, and they're not on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're never intended to be compilations. Exactly. Uh, you and I did they're a— letters. They're le exactly, to different different communities. And when you're writing— right, To Theodos. And when Luke you're... is not writing to Christians. He's writing to Theodos. He tells you. Theophilus. But yeah, when he's— Oh, Theophilus. I'm sorry. When... Theodos is one of the dudes who actually they thought was a different type of yeah. messiah. Yeah, exactly. Right? exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, but when, but when the they're, um, we did a whole show on Holy War of how it's clear that even in the New Testament, you have polemics back and forth against different, different veins mm -hmm. of Christian thought. And this stuff right. got compiled into one book. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. They're literally arguing about each other and they got put in the same book as if they're, you know, on the same page. And the first three books of Revelation are addressed to all the churches that Paul writes to, all the churches that Paul founded, and what what problems are they addressing? Eating meat, sacrificing idols. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Like, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> like literally all the things that the Book of Acts says. Oh yeah, we took care of this. Paul's on our on the same page. Revelation is writing again to those same churches, saying, "Listen, you got some false doctrines from from from." from from some false apostles saying you can do this, but guess what? You can't. And it's right. even it's even saying that Jesus is the one saying it to up the authority a little bit. Right. You can't eat things, sacrifice the idols. What does Paul say about that? He says, well, if you know the if you know the idol is meaningless, you can kind of do whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, even drinking things in the name of Jesus and drinking his blood and mocking in his flesh. Um, it says in Deuteronomy, you're not to worship anything that has an image of a male or female. So if you're doing that in the name of Jesus, you're going against not only the Torah, but Psalm 16 says, you know, don't, I'm not, I will not uh, pour out your blood libations in the name of another God. Exactly. And you drink a libation, you pour some out yeah. on the altar and then drink the libation. What is the Eucharist? It says, this is my blood, drink it. Drink it. That is that is spilled for you, meaning this is the blood of my sacrifice. Right. This is the blood that is spilled for you of the new covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood, right? Spilled for you. Drink it. You're symbolically drinking blood. You know? You're John literally Six. doing Lost Boys, right? Drinking exactly. Blood, exactly. Right? Like... John. <laughs> in John, the Eucharist is in chapter 6, and it's even more wacky than in the other ones. He's like, my, mm -hmm. you know, my flesh is meat indeed. Only then will you have indeed. eternal life if you eat it. It's like, what? Like, you're telling me I have to eat you to <laughs> go to heaven. <laughs> like, right. when you have David, but, when you have David saying, like, I'm not going to pour out, I'm not going to do a libation to any other God. Well, it's funny that you got people saying, oh, well, the rabbis added to the Torah. So Jesus didn't. <laughs> all that stuff where do you find any of that in the Torah that you got to eat the Messiah's uh, flesh and drink his blood but you want to accuse the rabbis of adding to the Torah but you're going to especially ignore... when you have an entire chapter of Deuteronomy 17 saying whatever the judges judge in a majority is what you listen to exactly they have a Torah they, based... that. they don't like that chapter they have a Torah based mandate to put fences around the Torah if they see fit and it's not adding right. to it. They're not adding, they're not writing something new in the Torah because that's really what the prohibition is. Right, right. Write, write new commandments in the Torah. That's, that's, or to erase commandments that are in the Torah. That's what the prohibition is. But to put a fence around the Torah, for example, if, let's put this in like a real world example. 
that anyone can relate to. If I have like a big ditch in my yard, um, and I tell my kids, don't run over there, you might fall in and hurt yourself, but I don't put anything around the ditch, they know that they're commanded to not run around close to the ditch because they might fall in and get hurt. But I, as the good parent, the good leader and good father I, I am, hypothetically, could put some caution tape around that to ensure they won't mm -hmm. fall in. <laughs> Right. Oh, and if I'm if I'm like really paranoid, really a good I might just fence it off. Fence, you know, yeah, put something even yeah, yeah. Or, a uh, barrier literal, or something, a literal right. fence around it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's going on if falling in the hole is the commandment, but there's a little bit of leeway given and it's kind of expecting you to have some integrity and not get as close to the edge as you could. Right. Mm -hmm. I might just say, listen, I'm going to put a fence up and then I know you can't get to the edge. So right. I'm helping you out. I'm helping you out. Right. Right. And they look at that as adding to the Torah. Opposed to just coming up with off the wall statements of drinking blood. Right. And, you know, it just, oh, you can't fast because the Messiah, the, your groom is with you. You can't fast. So Yom Kippur, all the, you know what I'm saying? That's that means for three years they didn't keep you on Kippur. Yeah. You keep, you, now you're making people sin because it says if you don't keep you on Kippur, right. you should be cut off from your people. And I could understand the argument of saying it's only the four fasts in Zechariah eight, but but it doesn't say that. <laughs> but even if you do hit me with that, and I say okay, fine, it is just those four fasts. Mm -hmm. What majority rabbinical authority of the Sanhedrin gave you the gave you that okay? Right. Well, to answer that, he says in Matthew 23, listen to the scribes and Pharisees. And in that that verse, it says the Pharisees and John's disciples fast, but y'all don't. Mm -hmm. So the Pharisees were on board and John's disciples were on board. And according to the text, John had a Holy Spirit. Right. So is that a sin against the Holy Spirit, which doesn't have forgiveness? <laughs> it's very interesting. Okay. Very can. interesting. <laughs> you know? Hey, man. That, and then that's just a proof that Jesus ain't God or Jesus is not the part of the Trinity because he said you can sin against him, but you can't sin against the Holy Spirit. Well, that means you're not part of the Trinity. And in Luke, can... in Luke, Jesus' disciples ask him and say, hey, can you please teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray? Jesus mm -hmm. says, yeah, sure. Now, how would he know that unless he was a disciple of John? And... Or part of that community. Right. Part of that community. <laughs> so if, if the leader of that community is fasting and you're not, it's interesting. You said you all, he also said that there's no, no man born of woman greater than John the Baptist. Right. He was born of a woman. Yeah. So why is he not fasting? And why is he, unless of course he did believe he was the Messiah, but if you read Zechariah 8, this is already like a messianic reality of the non-Jews realizing their error and flocking to the temple. Right? Like it's over already. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not just 13 guys walking around picking grain. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's nothing yeah. verifiable about that. And you didn't have the Deuteronomy 17 mandated like verifiable majority rule saying, yep, this guy's it. We can cease the fasts now. Right. Right. Just because one guy and his 12 followers do it doesn't mean it's legitimate. Right. He had that, no authority to do that. Then turn around and tell you to follow the scribes and Pharisees would, would, who would have been against it. Yeah. So yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So I think we've pretty, pretty clearly demonstrated all over the place that Luke probably didn't have the best info, right? Nope. And that genealogy kind of proves it, where it really it really is apparent that he was just pulling names out. He probably just looked, if I had to guess, if I could just make a guess, he probably just looked at some type of annals, you know what I mean? Like like a, a book of mm -hmm. 
Chronicles, not necessarily a holy book of Chronicles, but just an annals of the kings of Israel type thing, right? Mm -hmm. And just <laughs> started jotting them down. <laughs> started jotting them this down. Because that's pretty much what he did. He got a couple of names right, but some of them have no connection to anybody in the Tanakh. Like, where does his name come from? You know what I mean? Know. And this is just another example of, I have a series called Why I Left Christianity. And this is just another one of the reasons. It's not the reason, but it's just another one of, I can't do this. Like, it's just too many problems. It's too much, too much deception. And some of it is intentional and some of it is just ignorance. Yep. And you don't offer nothing new. Like, yeah. There's nothing that you can offer that the Tanakh doesn't already offer. Exactly. Exactly. So, and it gets it really gets to the point. I think we've all hit that point where at what point is enough and enough? I can't justify this anymore because there's always the way to explain something away. But right. Right. You start hitting, how many times? <laughs> exactly. When do you start hitting that number, that amount of problems where it's like, man, there is just no more hula hoops I can spin right. to make this right. make sense. Right. So, yeah. But at the core, we started with how church tradition and the book doesn't even agree. Which one do we go with? Right. Right. It doesn't agree. And then it wants you to accept the tradition, but reject everybody else's tradition. Mm -hmm. so. And then new traditions get created by people who are sola scriptura by saying, oh, this is Mary's genealogy, even though it doesn't say that. Right which means that's now a tradition. That's something orally transmitted now, an idea, you know, and reject the one that's been around for goodness knows how long, <laughs> 1800, right. 1800 years. Right. By the early church fathers, exactly. Occam's razor suggests that the one 1900 years ago probably has a better chance of being true than the one formulated now. Well, you know, the old saying, what's new or what's true is not new, and what's new is probably not true. Right. So. so what we see is, and this can be the final point, apologists, Christian theologians, you know, lump them all together. They will use tradition when it benefits them. They will make their own traditions when it benefits them, because really there's no oversight here. It's like once you once you severed yourself from the orthodoxy, you now have no true oversight. That's how you have forty thousand denominations. Right, right, right. There's no, right. there's no, there's no um, chief. Admit, there's no chief head. There's really no leadership. Right, it's, like you said, it's a free for all. And to, to make my final point is now they're going into the Torah's oral tradition to justify Jesus because exactly. they exhausted every other angle. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, if you're going to accept the oral tradition, which parts of that are you going to reject? Because you're not going to accept all of it because it will shut you down. Mm -hmm. So it's now they're at the, I think they're at their last stage of digging into the midrashes and everything. And we know no halakhic judgments are based on midrash. Right. So why would you use that to justify something as if it's literal when you're not even allowed to do that according to the oral tradition? So we can go on and on, but that'd be my last point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, it's, we talked about a lot of things, covered a lot of topics, um, a lot more than I even expected. We kind of just, kind of just got rolling. <laughs> right. You no, know, but I think it all, it all ties back to the fact that there's a lot of gymnastics going on. Um, oh man. And a willingness I don't want to sound too harsh, but what's seemingly a willingness to be dishonest, disingenuous when it suits. But like, I don't want to be, because I'm sure they're just trying to find a way to, you know, edify their faith, right? But they're doing it in all the wrong ways. But I do think there are some that are, in fact, disingenuous. But completely. But um, for the most part, I think. A lot of the people doing this are good people. They were brought up in a religion. They were brought up in a tradition. 
um, and they want to find ways to continually prove it to themselves, right? It's just it doesn't always work. And when you actually just kind of take that step back and just read it, right? Just weigh the stuff next to each other. You'll come to find it just doesn't work, you know? Right. And that's and, how. And remember, Paul says you're allowed to lie as long as you, you know, the ends justify the means. Yep. Exactly. You know, he right. says he says in pretense, you're like you, you know, you can you can lie as long as you know the ends justify the means. And and I came to you crafty and by deceit, you know, by my lie, why am I still being persecuted? Because I did it for right. Christ. I can be the Jew to the Jew. Like he he basically tells you it's okay to lie as long as it's for Jesus. Sure, exactly. So many words. He so, says to the Jew, know. I became a Jew, to the non-Jew, I became a non-Jew. And you know where I really think that stems from? What's that? He makes he makes it permissible that you can that you can adapt, be a chameleon, do whatever it takes. Put on the put on the you know, put on the hat of whatever suits you that day. But I think it really like ties in with his view of the kingdom and how it's spiritual and the transformed body because he says there's no Jew and there is no Gentile. There's no male and there's no I, so if there there's no really, standard if there is no standard if there is no binary there's no male or female there's no Jew or Gentile we're all the same in the kingdom of God right we're all adopted into the family of God via Christ well then it really doesn't matter what you do as long as you bring more people into the kingdom well Philippians one eighteen this is the Christian standard version Christian standard Bible CSB what does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So he rejoices if you teach Jesus from false motives or true ones. Philippians 118. It's in the text. Yep. <laughs> false motives. What? <laughs> So mm -hmm. yeah, we can we can go on and off. So <laughs> yeah, once once we open up the can, it just it just goes <laughs> forever, you know. But in my opinion, I think that's really where he found it permissible was because in his view of the kingdom, there's there's no there's no boundaries, there's no walls. Nope. We're all the same. So as long as I'm bringing people in the kingdom, how does it matter how I'm doing it? And I might even be giving Paul a bit more fair of a shake than I should, but that's just going based upon his writings of how he viewed the kingdom and its spiritual right. nature. And it's almost like, I don't know, what's what would be the word to describe that? Like the ends justify the means. Yeah, but that's, I mean like but like his view of the kingdom, like we're all just the same, like like communism, basically. The early church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The early church was we're all the same, right? Your property is my Essenes. Sure. That's the how the Essenes saw it, right? Right. When you, when you go places, don't take no money, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's just go over there and get that donkey. Well, who we don't care who it belongs to, just go take that donkey and right. Like you see the mindset. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But yeah, guys. Everyone, please check out Clouds of Torah on YouTube. My good friend Davon Mays, he puts out lots of brilliant content. Um, and normally in a lot longer fashion than even he and I do on here. You know, four, five, six, seven-part series that really just go so in-depth, you know. So if you're really looking for, like, the meat and potatoes type teachings, that's the place to go. So, uh, also his books linked in description, please pick them up. It's going to help him out. It helps me out. You're going to learn something. And just like on here, how it's probably going to be perspective you've yet to hear before all over the place. So Davon, any, any closing remarks? Um, I appreciate coming on the platform. Um, 
Thanks for the shout outs to the books and the and my YouTube page. Peace and blessings to everybody. Don't believe nothing we have said. Do your own research. There's plenty, there's too much information out today to where it's kind of a crime to be ignorant. Yep. Now I know nobody's gonna know everything, but, but just to be able to look stuff up, like today we pulled from the Encyclopedia Encyclopedia uh, Britannica, right? Mm -hmm. That's not a Christian or a Jewish source. That's just a resource, mm -hmm. right? So you can you don't have to use the Bible to prove points. Just look in the history. And me personally, I listen to people that I disagree with just to see where they come, where they get their perspective from. Sure. You can learn a lot from people you disagree with to see how they think. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, um, do your own research and uh, may the most high bless y'all. I mean, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I can't stress that same point enough. Uh, the wise person is the one who learns from everybody. So go out there, open the books up. Like I said, Encyclopedia Britannica, excellent resource, and they don't have a dog in the fight. It's not a, it's not a source biased in one direction of the, or the other. Um, that's why I use it, you know? Mm -hmm. So feel free to do your own research. Like the, the stuff that Davon and I normally bring when we, when we do shows, they're not programs that we've devoted four years of study to for just one presentation. You know, <laughs> we're in the age of the internet now. Stuff is very accessible. Just make sure you're going to reliable sources. Like don't, don't go to conspiracy theorist.org or something like that, but something reliable, you know, and weigh it against what the book says. In fact, there have been shows, this might blow your mind. There have been shows where I used only Christian commentaries from a historical, historical perspective, like Ellicott's commentary or Matthew Henry's commentary, where I only use that as my resource to dig into the history of what they're bringing and tease that out then, studying every name, who the, like we just did, the last video we did was Year of the Beast. And mm -hmm. we talked about the names that are mentioned in these different passages in Romans and, and so on. And look at all the history we teased out just by taking a few names in a verse that most people would just overlook and studying out who that person was in a historical context. And it gives us so much insight into what Paul is talking about, who he's talking to, and what message he's trying to get across. Mm -hmm. So don't just read the book, people. Like, take the time to dig in, you know? And I think you'll be amazed at really how much is out there. But, yeah, as I always say, if you're having these questions, feel free to reach me, reach out to me. Davon's always prompt to answer as well. Um, hit him on the YouTube channel, drop a comment. Uh, but until next time, I'm Steve Eisenhower. This was the Exodus Project. We'll see you next time, everybody.